cowboy grub, also known as food. Grant Coors Ranch National Historic Site, Deer Lodge, Montana. A National Park Service ranger stands in front of a wooden wagon with a canvas top. To the left is a line of cottonwood trees in the background, as well as some wooden fences. There is a stone fire ring in front of the fence, and a cowboy is working at the rear of the wagon. Hello! Welcome to Grant Coors Ranch National Historic Site here in Deer Lodge, Montana. Have you ever camped under the stars? Did you look up into that night sky and look at all those beautiful stars? Did you ever want to keep doing that every night, all summer long? Well, if so, you might have a little idea of what it was like to be a cowboy. Behind me is a chuck wagon. Chuck wagons were wooden wagons with these canvas tops. There's also some cottonwood trees over here. My name's Rachel Crystal. Today, let's learn a little bit about these cattle drives and these chuck wagons. I do see that there's a cook here today. I wonder if he'd be willing to share some stories with us about cattle drives. Come and get it! Hey, Cookie, would you be willing to take a few minutes and talk to us about some chuck wagons? Yeah, I'd love to. I just got done cooking, so I'm about ready to sit down and, and talk for a little while. Sure, great. Yeah, Let's come share on over. some stories. The range Cookie are sitting around a stone fire ring with a campfire burning. Behind them are cut trees and a wooden fence. What kind of meal did you cook? What was the favorite of the cowboys? Well, you think about yourself waking up at, you know, I'll ask all of you, think about yourself waking up at 3.30 in the morning, and then you gotta ride on a horse all day long, doing really hard work, lots of labor out there, and then you don't get to go to bed until nine o'clock at night. Well, what kind of food would you wanna eat all day long if you gotta be working that hard? I want hearty filling food. And you want probably something that's going to stick to your ribs a little bit there. Well, that's pretty much what cowboys eat. Mm -hmm. The one thing I got to make sure I have all the time with every single meal, sourdough biscuits. Sourdough. Oh, I love sourdough bread. They are pretty good. They are and pretty good. And you probably good. have some variety of shapes and, and forms you can put that in. because It's pretty versatile bread. It is. You can do all sorts of things with it, but usually I just do the easiest and quickest thing where I just take a... Full, I, I got a, a good size keg that I keep what we call a sourdough starter in because you, you have to kind of get the yeast working in there. Uh, but I'll have the dough in there and I'll pull out little balls of it and just make a little ball okay. and then stick them into the bottom of a Dutch oven, which has been greased up. And then you just put that lid on top there and let them bake. These Dutch ovens, what are they made out of? It's usually made out of iron. Oh, that's got to be really heavy. Yeah, it is pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy, but one of the reasons why that wagon was so important. So underneath the chuck box right there, there was another cabinet underneath. That's usually where you store all the Dutch ovens, all the pots, all the pans. So I'm not having to lift them in and out of the wagon then? Not usually. A lot of folks that have campfires today usually build up a nice, really big one here. That would have been completely useless to me out there. What we want to do is build up a nice, good-sized fire and then let all that burn down to coals. And what I'll do with that Dutch oven, the whole it was designed to do this and why it cooks so well is that you bury it into those coals and then the flat lid on top, you pile more coals on top of it. So it's just like an oven at home. It it's cooks, heating it's heating from it. all the way around it. And the best part about those Dutch ovens was you could cook anything in those things. Did you just kill the cattle you were driving? Oh no, <laughs> oh no, no, no. Uh, Rancher would be pretty pretty upset with us if we were killing the, his cattle because every one of those cattle was money in their pocket. They want to oh, sell those at market true. where they could they could get a lot of money for them. So if one got injured, then there was really no sense in letting that cow go to waste or letting that steer go to waste. Uh, another thing that they would run into on the range out there, it wasn't like those trail drives. It's not like that, that cowboy outfit was just out there completely alone by themselves. During these trail drives, they were almost like super highways oh you would be like our in, interstates in, today kind of like an interstate those those cattle trails going north there are lots and lots of people thousands and thousands and thousands of cattle being pushed north every year on those cattle tribes so you know we imagine ourselves sitting this wagon right now if we we're in the middle of a trail drive you know say if we're down in nebraska or something like that we'd probably be looking all around us and see dust clouds coming up in all directions around us so we'd have 
probably tens of thousands of other cattle surrounding us while well, sometimes strays come out from those other herds. We can't get it back to them. We get some beef out of that. But one of the biggest sources of beef out there was sometimes cattle would get sprays out there and a lot of them would do what cattle do naturally out there. They make baby cattle. No. Well, if they didn't have a brand on it, that kind of means that nobody owns it. We call them maverick. If we find those mavericks out there, since nobody owns it. No one will miss it. Nobody's going to miss it. So that, that becomes a good source of beef to keep us going out there. You know, if we hit towns and things, we could probably get some kind of cured meat, like salt pork. It's kind of bacon. like it's kind of like bacon. Yeah. And periodically, the cook does want to make a, a few treats or, or a few different things just to kind of switch it up a little bit. But it's also just to keep them going. You know, there, there's an old saying out there of an army marches on its stomach. I can't think of many other people throughout history where that was more true than cowboys back in the day. Because they had to have their bellies full to keep doing what they did, especially with so little sleep. You know, if you're working so hard all day long for so long, every single day, from before the sun is up to after the sun is down, you've got to have some really filling food to keep you going. So that beef out there was pretty important to have that really rib sticking meat. Lots of protein and calories. Lots keep of protein and calories. Keep going. So what kind of desserts do the cowboys have? Well, out there in the open range, usually not that much for dessert. Usually not, not a whole lot of ways to cure a sweet tooth out there. It's usually you get a dessert as a special treat okay. if the cook had some extra time to do it. Uh, one of the things that would be carried in the chuck wagon, and you can probably find this in grocery stores today, dried out fruit. So you yeah, get dried fruit, fruit like trail like mix, that. dried fruits. sort of like trail mix and things like that. So maybe some dried apples, dried peaches, and things, right. and then you soak that in water to they call it rehydrate it, put all the moisture back in there. Yeah, and then you'll make some dough, stick that in the bottom of one of those Dutch ovens, put all that rehydrated fruit back in there, put a little crust on the top. Now you got yourself a pie. Cowboy favorite was called spotted pup. Spotted pup, because it was such a cowboy favorite, what it basically was, was uh, rice with raisins put in there, and it was boiled in a sack. It sounds like tapioca pudding. It's kind of like tapioca pudding or, or rice pudding. Rice pudding. It's basically what it would be. I know a lot of people who love to cook really love different spices and flavors. Did you have herbs and spices to cook with? Yeah, usually one of the things you keep in the chuck wagon here are some spices and things so that you can, you can flavor the meats that you're working with. Uh, kind of dependent on the outfit and the cook himself, how many different spices he's going to be carrying along with them out there, salt, and pepper, and things like that. But cinnamon they might have in there to mm. get some cinnamon. You said there's not a lot of sweet treats. It sounds like the sugary flavor comes from the fruit. It comes from the fruit or a few other things that they would have, but not usually sugar. But what they had was other kinds of sweeteners. So maybe they had molasses. Ooh. They might have some kind of syrup, especially they had something called sorghum syrup. It was kind of a sweetener that they would use for, for all sorts kind of like things. Like a corn syrup. Kind of like a corn syrup, yeah. Did you have canned vegetables, canned fruits, any canned goods that were available? Was that around? Plenty that of them, fun? lots of canned goods. Lots of canned goods by you know late 1800s when a lot of this is happening. And typically, if cowboys are getting vegetables out there, that's where they're getting their vegetables from. It's from a can. Canned tomatoes. That oh. was a, that was a, talk about sweet treats for a cowboy. That was one of those few sweet treats you get out there is canned tomatoes. Well, plus you have the liquid inside the can, some tomato juice. Tomato juice. That's why cowboys love those canned tomatoes so much. It's uh, if you couldn't get back to the wagon for lunch and that cowboy was thinking ahead out there, Maybe he grabbed himself a can or two of canned tomatoes. That'd be a whole meal right there. That's pretty much what it was. It was kind of like a cowboy happy meal back in the day. Because oh, that's Because nothing would cool. make him happier than if you're <laughs> stuck in your saddle during lunch and can't make it back to the wagon. You got that little bit of canned tomatoes right there. Yeah, and it wouldn't have taken a lot of space maybe in their bag. No, you could probably fit that into a couple pockets in your slicker. Just carry them on out there. So we've talked food. What did cowboys drink? Well, one of these things about uh, the chuck wagon right here in that cook, the one thing above all others that he had to make sure that he had 24 hours a day was coffee. Coffee? Cowboy that's a, that's a breakfast drink. 
not if you're a cowboy. That's an all the time drink. <laughs> an all the time that's, drink. That's, a, that's something that you want when you first crawl out of your bedroll in the morning. That's what you want when you come into camp to get your midday meal. That's what you want when you're ending your day, coming back into camp to settle down or relax, that cup of coffee. That's what you want when you got to wake up and crawl out of your bedroll in the middle of the night to ride night herd. And that's what you want when you get back from night herd and are about to go back to sleep. You want that warmth of that cup of coffee before you go in. But so many people, they, they cut off their caffeine intake, you know, several hours before they go to bed because they say the caffeine keeps them awake all night. Wouldn't that have affected the cowboys too? That's that's a good question. But, you know, you've got to, all of you out there, imagine yourself for six months, you get five hours of sleep every night. And that's not even straight through because remember, they got to wake up for two hours. So maybe you'll sleep for three hours, get up, ride night her for two hours, then come back and get another hour and a half or two hours of sleep. People love putting milk and cream and sugar and flavors into their coffee. Were the cowboys the same? Why would you spoil a perfectly good cup of coffee with canned cow, which is what they called milk? Nobody was going out there and milking the cattle herd which, by the way, you couldn't really do because they weren't cows. They were steers, which are boy cows. So you can't milk them for any milk. So they would have cans, just like those vegetables. They would have cans of milk. Oh, yeah, not dairy cows going not up Not dairy the trail. cows going up that trail, no. And then sugar. They didn't usually have sugar out there. Some cowboys had never even seen sugar before in their lives. There was one cowboy on a trail drive. Teddy Blue Abbott noticed this. He was a Texas cowboy. Well, this poor guy had never seen sugar in his life. Some Easterner had his own little sack of sugar and he put it into his coffee. Walked over to this Texas cowboy and said, you want to put some of this in coffee? Well, that cowboy looked back at him and said, I don't take salt in my coffee. Oh, they do look a lot alike. I could see where the confusion was. The confusion, yeah. Definitely. So, pure straight black coffee. Straight black coffee is black as you could get and as strong as you could get it, too. You see a lot of people going to coffee shops today and everything and ordering all sorts of stuff to be added in there and real particular about it. Nobody was more particular about their coffee than Cowboys. It had to be made the right way. And if they're drinking that much of it, they want exactly what they're used to. Oh, they, they definitely do. But the, the whole process of making Cowboy coffee begins with the coffee itself. It comes in a one pound little package. And it's called Arbuckle's Coffee. I've never heard of that brand. Well, you don't really see it around as much anymore. Okay. But back then, Arbuckles was pretty popular. And we can guess for a few different reasons. You know, one of the reasons that Cowboys might have liked it so much was the Arbuckle Brothers of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, found a way to seal the flavor into the coffee beans. Because back then, if you buy coffee, uh, it doesn't come ground up. It's like it's, it's these little grounds. Maybe it kind of looks like dirt when you see it inside the packaging. Well, back then it was the whole coffee bean that you got. Whole bean, okay. And it wasn't dark brown. It was bright green. Green beans. Green beans. Because you have to roast the coffee bean before you can grind them down and use it in the coffee. Well, then I just burn them all the time, probably. Maybe. I'd probably do the same thing. But what the Arbuckle brothers did, they roasted the coffee beans ahead of time. So they didn't have to do that part. It's a little less work out there. Just like you can buy it in the store today. Then. Just like you can buy it in the store today. And then they soaked all of them. They think they, they sealed that flavor into the beans by soaking them in a solution of egg whites and sugar. One of the reasons why those cowboys like Arbuckle so much, they would hide a peppermint stick in every package of their coffee. Hey, there was some candy on these cowboys. There was a fries. little bit of candy out there. And not only that, but if the cook was having a hard day, maybe he could get one of those cowboys to actually help him out with the cooking a little bit by asking the cowboys if, you grind up the beans for me, you get to keep the peppermint stick. Oh, so there. he shared the co the these uh, peppermint sticks then. It wasn't just the cook getting them all. Maybe not all the time. So people I know today, like, are very loyal to particular brands of coffee. So it sounds like the Cowboys, it was all about the Arbuckles. It certainly was about the Arbuckles. Because no nothing else would do for coffee. If it wasn't Arbuckles, it Forget wasn't it. coffee. Forget it. Cookie, thanks for your time today and telling us all of the stories and helping us really learn a lot about the cowboys and these cattle drives. You are more than welcome. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. Credits. Ranger. Crystal Tongish. Cookie. Glenn Gilly.
filmed on location at Grant Coors Ranch National Historic Site in Deer Lodge, Montana.